flavor of several frames from negative flavor. Okay, and the task again is if we have the whole video, we do need to predict the emotion uh, on the you know, effect of this video, one of the three classes. And um, th this was a challenge of um, emotion recognition in the wild uh, last year, and a uh, sub challenge. And there are several, several ideas, several main ideas of the participants of this challenge. And let me briefly introduce the main ideas. Uh, they are more or less uh, close to each other. So this is the GAFNET, so it's published by the authors of this data set. So at first they provided the data set and then they provided some baseline. So this is a baseline and uh, actually even this baseline is really, uh, is really uh, similar to the, um, uh, to the methods that were proposed during this challenge. So there are, so most of these uh, methods are ensemble methods. So you have, uh, you see here, there are three parts. One of the parts analyzes the whole image, the image at all is uh, using some neural network. Uh, another part is uh, devoted on the uh, prediction of affect based on the faces. So you extract, detect faces, and then you analyze facial expressions, or for example, uh, facial emotions, or I don't know, something like this. And then they uh, used this part of ensemble. And also there are part uh, related to analysis of audio features. So, and uh, they, here are some part of this paper, so the ablation study, they show that uh, uh, these parts are necessary. The audio features are not so important, so they are not so, uh, they can provide really high accuracy, but you see that the fusion uh, leads to something like 60%. So it's a rather complex task. You see that there are three classes and 61%. So yeah, it's uh, of, of the baseline. And I will show you that the, uh, top uh, performance uh, slightly higher, uh, achieve the score slightly higher than 70 uh, 70 percent so it's really really complex task but you see that for example face features are uh, close to here so face features are the most important here and uh, that, but uh, I will show you later that our main ideas uh, so our uh, I, our method is mainly based on protein of face facial features so uh, and uh, let me introduce Brief, very briefly introduce the uh, participants, I mean the winners of this challenge, uh, three uh, main places. So this is the third place, it's uh, K-injection audiovisual network. So there are some uh, attention mechanisms, there is analysis of audio. Um, there is also a really interesting part uh, from my point of view, analysis of, uh, so they describe the video using some text and then they analyze this text using BERT. Uh, word embeddings, yes, and some uh, gates recurrent units, something like this. And also the parts are related to analysis of uh, the whole video frames, uh, the audio, uh, and tension mechanism, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, uh, the, uh, the third place. The second place uh, is for spatial temporal fusion. So they provide a huge ensemble with different parts. So one of them is attention, again, attention for faces. So it's a frame attention network, so-called. So you extract faces in each frame, then you extract features, and then you combine them using some attention uh, with one or two layers. Uh, also, there is really interesting here they want to analysis of the whole video it's so you using so-called method slow fast method and they um, deal with different uh, frame rates so they uh, extract uh, frames at low frame rate they extract rates frames with high frame rate and then they analyze them in different parts here and then they provide some ensemble solution and actually here is the whole um, the whole idea, and the, you see that the input video is divided into several parts, and all these uh, bounded box, all, all these rectangles, is a single classifier. So you see that there are plenty of different classifiers, uh, like uh, analysis of the whole image, faces, face key points, body, and uh, audio, and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, it's really, really slow. So it's really, really slow. It's appropriate maybe for uh, challenges, but it's absolutely inappropriate for real-time processing of videos and uh, analysis of emotions of video of the crowd. And uh, here's the winner of this challenge, and uh, they're really good. 
as, uh, as I see. So they propose so-called holistic network. But again, it's an ensemble of several parts. So it's a part devoted to audio processing with open smile features, uh, some emotion recognition of faces, uh, sure, um, object detection and detected objects, what are objects there, and also analysis of some, uh, the whole videos, uh, I don't know, something, something like this. Yeah, this is part is devoted to the whole videos we're using TSM networks. So um, this uh, uh, this is the end. Yeah, this is the end of um, the uh, literature server here. And I should say that uh, okay, what's the main conclusion to this part? So first of all, so first of all, uh, you see that uh, the participants uh, provided uh, ensembles of many different classifiers. And actually, I didn't show it here, but in the ablation study, they demonstrated that uh, all most of the parts of this ensembles are important. So it's uh, if you consider only one uh, single classifier, I mean, only one single feature like faces or audio or I don't know some video, the whole video, the sequence of frames, uh, it can't reach the uh, performance or I mean the accuracy of the whole of the whole uh, fused model. Yeah. So it's really it's really difficult to create some simple model uh, which can be used uh, and which can you know, be first of all fast and then which can be really accurate. So actually this is our task of, uh, this is the task of uh, this paper and uh, our report here, uh, how to uh, solve this uh, task. I mean, uh, how to predict effect using a small ensemble or even one classifier and how to do it efficiently, how to do it fast, how to do it uh, more or less accurate. So uh, for sure, we uh, are not, um, we, we don't assume that we can reach uh, the performance. I mean, the accuracy of ensemble of 12 or even, I don't know, 17 classifiers of some participant. Yep. So we want to make it fast because um, actually these videos should be processed in real time or in some, in close to real time when you need to make a decision about some effect of a crowd or during the meeting, for example, or uh, if you need to analyze the behavior of a group of students uh, listening to um, some conference. So in all this case, you need something close to real time processing. So uh, how we deal with this uh, task? So we use the, we mainly use the facial expression recognition uh, and facial emotion uh, analysis. So we used uh, the neural network uh, proposed in, uh, proposed here. So it's a multitask neural network. It was pre-trained on, first of all, on face identification, and then it's uh, fine-tuned on the facial expression recognition. And uh, the most important part here is that uh, despite um, the conventional approach uh, for uh, pre-training on face identification, we didn't use uh, central crop with some uh, hairs background or something like this. We use them, we cropped them without any margins. So we ignore some parts, bottom parts probably of the face and we ignore uh, the hairs. Uh, so we mainly concentrate on the face itself and uh, we mainly concentrate on the facial expression recognition. So in this case, uh, we probably um, decrease the accuracy of face identification or face recognition, but we hope we can reach the uh, good quality of facial emotion recognition. And in this particular paper, it was um, shown that, yeah, we can, uh, we can obtain really good quality of face expression recognition on static images, for example. Yeah. So, and uh, here is the uh, the main part of uh, the training model. So you have, you see the facial image, and uh, there is a convolutional neural network. So first of all, it's pre-trained to extract identity features, face identity features, using softmax loss or probably arc face. It doesn't matter right uh, here. Uh, then, um, according to this pipeline, it was fine-tuned, uh, uh, it's partially fine-tuned here uh, for several facial attribute recognition tasks, and then it was, uh, most part of this network was fine-tuned for, on uh, some large data set of emotion recognition to predict emotions from a static image. So this is only for static images. So you have a facial image, it's not a video itself. Yep, and we need to predict the, this emotion and uh, we will use such kind of neural network to extract features of faces for our group level uh, emotion cognition task. Uh, 
Okay, so we use uh, so rather large data set, which is a phase two data set to pre-train the phase identity, uh, phase identification. Yep. So uh, these are the parameters of this data set and some examples. So it's really well known and uh, it's well known that uh, pre-training on this data set lead to really good quality of phase identification. But again, as, as I said uh, before, we used uh, the margins of these faces, so we didn't consider the background, we didn't consider some uh, hair, <laughs> sorry, no hairs, uh, hairs here, we did consider some, uh, some something here, so we mainly concentrated on the part of the face related to emotion. Uh, and uh, this is the data set in which we fine tuned uh, our network. So this is the well known EffectNet data set with eight uh, different emotions. And this is the training data set, uh, which was labeled manually. And here are some examples of the data set. Yep, uh, what's really important here, I should say, that we used so called sharpness aware uh, minimization uh, during the training of this network. And uh, we obtained slightly better results if we didn't use it. So let me briefly recall what's the idea of this uh, of this uh, paper. So we uh, so the loss function is modified, slightly modified. So this is the loss function, and this loss function uh, is based on some general loss function like uh, cross uh, softmax loss function, like cross entropy, weighted cross entropy. In this particular case, but here we add some. Um, some uh, absolute, some robust. So we, so they, uh, the main idea of this paper is that they provide some robustness. They require some robustness of the decision, uh, so that if we slightly change the weights of the neural network, then we still obtain real, rather low, rather a low value of the loss function. So this is a well known criteria for any method like robust data mining. And then this is the optimal solution in some approximation using Taylor series. Uh, yep, and uh, you know probably that this maximum is achieved in some in, in the direction of the gradient. So if we use the if we minimize it, we need the gradient. So we need to uh, we need this gradient, and we and it's computed similar uh, um, in using this approximate uh, equation. And uh, here is the solution of this epsilon, which provides the maximum for this function if we use the Taylor, um, Taylor expansion. Okay, and this is the um, part from this paper, how they demonstrate what's the difference between the, uh, between the uh, conventional, I don't know, I'll classify like Adam or stochastic gradient descent. And here is the, this sharp as aware minimization technique. So I, I should say that it uh, really works in many cases, but <laughs> actually it doesn't work uh, much for transformers, but it really works for convolutional neural network and uh, for, convolution, for various convolutional neural networks. And uh, that's why we use it. And we obtained, uh, we observed slightly, so some improvement in uh, result accuracy. So here is um, actually the proposed pipeline of, uh, uh, so we use this uh, convolutional network to extract features. And here's the whole pipeline. So we have a video, we extract uh, face, uh, faces using something like MCCNN or something like this. Then we um, identify these faces and then we group them, cluster them. And after that, we compute these emotional features. So this uh, part is solved using some face identification network. This part is used using another network like emotional feature extraction. So in uh, our uh, in our approach, we uh, use this network and fine tune it on uh, AffectNet dataset and obtain this network. So we have two neural networks. One is used to, to cluster uh, faces, and another one is used to yeah, to uh, to extract the emotional features. And after that, what we use here, we um, we, we didn't use um, attention or we didn't use some uh, recurrent neural networks because uh, the data set is not so large and we observed that uh, the more simple solution works better. So it doesn't lead to overfitting, for example. So we concatenate the features, I mean, the individual features of faces using uh, some statistical features. Here are the example of mean yesterday, but uh, in uh, the final pipeline, we still use only um, maximum or on, only one part of these features and after that we compute the whole feature so we compute the features for each uh, face and then we compute the whole features for the whole video 
So uh, in some in, in, in some other way, how to distribute it, we can uh, compute the frame wise feature. So this is the features of, um, of of the frame of all faces in one frame, and after that we compute the video descriptor. So uh, here we will show in our ablation study that um, simple maximal. Uh, features will work better. And uh, for computing the video descriptor, we are interested only in uh, standard deviation of these features, of these frame wise features. So, but for sure, we can use any, uh, we can use uh, so called stat features uh, and concatenate mean, uh, maximum, uh, standard deviation, and so on and so forth. So, here is how proposed algorithm uh, I said too, that it's based on phase detection and is only on facial analysis. So, analysis of facial. But actually, we um, examined some part how to improve the quality if we can analyze, for example, audio. So, if the audio modality is available, we can compute some uh, emotional embeddings for audio and using some blame of class of two classifiers so this part is optional and uh, i will show you that um, i i believe that uh, it's not required it can only uh, in, it can increase the overall accuracy but the increase is not so uh, is not so high so in generally we can uh, concentrate only on this part so we can use only we can process on the face so here is our experimental results on this GAF data set this is the ablation study and uh, the validation accuracy for various uh, features. And uh, so we uh, here is the stack features to uh, combine facial embeddings in one frame. And this is how we can bind frames in a video. And you see that we have two neural networks. So we are concentrated on um, uh, fast computations. And that's why we were concentrated on, so we train such networks like mobile net and efficient net. And um, actually, what's uh, really interesting here, I should uh, highlight here that efficient net, uh, so mobile net works slightly better. So right now, uh, after the publication of the, uh, after the preparation of this paper, we trained another neural network efficient net B2. So this is efficient net B0. And we trained efficient net B2 and uh, we slightly increase the accuracy when compared to mobile net. But again, uh, efficient net B2 is much more computation expensive. So I don't, so if uh, we concentrate on the, um, on the performance, on the running time, then probably the mobile net is the best choice. Here and you see that uh, the best uh, the best uh, the best uh, choice here is uh, 68 and 93. I believe 68 and 93 also here and uh, yeah and, uh, something like this. Okay, so this is the uh, some additional part of this validation accuracy. So this is one classifier and also this is ablation study of different classifiers. And you see that the best results are obtained just for maximizing the features inside one frame and computing the standard deviation using uh, these uh, features of, for the whole video. Here is uh, approximately 70%, slightly less than 70%. So you see it's really simple. So you compute the mobile net uh, features, you extract the features using mobile net, and then you uh, combine them using maximal, uh, com uh, maximal statistical function. And after that, you compute the standard deviation of these features and you obtain the same dimensionality of the feature vector and you obtain really good quality. So yeah, this is about performance against the running time and uh, yeah, running time, average running time per one phase for CPU and GPU of uh, some, yeah, some mobile device. Actually, so the idea was how to implement this in mobile device. So you see that it's really, it's, it's so rather fast, but for sure, if we have a plenty of faces, plenty of detected faces, then we need to process all of them. So it's some kind of disadvantage of this approach. And this is a comparison with existing techniques. I mean, with uh, ensembles. So this is ensemble solutions, uh, the best known single, uh, single models. So here is our uh, part here. So it's, it's better than any existing single model. So it's based on the phase analysis. Slow fast is really good. But if we, for example, take a look at the uh, processing of faces, yeah, you see that it's 64%. It's the best uh, solution of the vineyard. So they use dense net 121. It's uh, uh, more computation. It's so our pr approach is more computation efficient, and it's uh, four uh, percent. Uh, it has uh, four percent higher accuracy. So it's really, it's really good. Uh, so uh, this uh, individual classifier works really good. And uh, if we uh, take a look at the ensemble, our ensemble, very simple ensemble with audio features, you see that we increase the accuracy to approximately 72%. So it's, uh, yeah, two, 
uh, greater than 2% increase. I'm not sure that it's uh, important in all cases, so maybe this uh, performance is uh, more or less appropriate. Uh, but nevertheless, if it's possible, why don't why not do it if we have the possibility to do it? So you see that we still we're still worse than the top uh, the winner, which uses this uh, really complex ensemble. But uh, I'm pretty sure that if we add our model for face process to this winner, unfortunately, they didn't uh, provide their source code, their model. So, but anyway, if we add it, we definitely increase this accuracy because our face processing is much better and their face processing is the most the most important part of this ensemble. Yep, and uh, for example, we are better, we're slightly, but <laughs> we're slightly, but better than the Fusion of 14 models. We are much better than the uh, third place with um, the K injection network. We are better than this um, ensemble of uh, baseline of this challenge. So it's really good results. Here are the confusion matrices of the faces of the person of faces only. Of audio, you see that audio uh, classified not so good, but natural is more or less the same, but positive is not so good. Yeah, positive uh, is classified really, really, really bad performance. And here is a, our ensemble of our blending. You see that it's still slightly better than these faces. So if we can process our uh, faces and audio, let's do it. But if we don't need it, probably even this part is, you know, so, okay, here is the conclusion. So we achieved uh, high accuracy when compared to previously known best single models. So we added some robustness to face extraction and alignment. And um, our approach is based on really, really simple mobile net architecture. So it can be used in any mobile device and any, any even on some edge devices, so on uh, video surveillance systems and so on and so forth. But uh, for sure, there are some disadvantages. And first of all, it's slightly uh, slightly, uh, so it's not so good as the top, but so it's a winner of this challenge. And uh, yeah, there is some future work on how to improve it by using again some ensembles. So as I said, we can change the architecture to efficient net B2 or B3, and we can increase the uh, accuracy. But again, it will be um, done by using by decreasing the performance. So thanks for attention. And if someone has some question, I will be glad to answer it. Okay, let me take a look at our time. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for your presentation, Andre. Uh -huh. Do you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to ask a question. Uh, in your conclusion, you stated that um, your approach could be applied uh, in mobile applications. So my question is, uh, do you see, do you, have you already thought of any particular task uh, for mobile applications uh, where your approach could be applied? Uh, yeah, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for this question. Um, actually, actually, yeah, right now we work on some, um, on some, uh, on some application which can use partially our, our approach. So this application is analysis of, um, videos of students, I mean, behavior of students listening to some course or something like this. And, uh, in many cases, uh, the, uh, the listeners work on the mobile, uh, uh, listen to the course on the mobile device. Yep. And, uh, in this case, so they, so they are listeners or students. So they, uh, have on the mobile device and probably it's uh, really important to analyze the performance or, I mean, to analyze the, um, engagement of uh, students to this, uh, to the online lecture, for example, and, uh, one of, so uh, this is our project and, uh, you know, that in many cases, it's, uh, it's not desired to move the video of a face to some remote server. And that's why we extract features of each, um, listener on his particular device. And after that, we, uh, move this features to some uh, laptop, for example, of a teacher, and uh, it can analyze uh, the parts of his lecture, which are not so, um, uh, I mean, uh, which, uh, which, in which 
uh, there were problems uh, or in which the students are, were not engaged, for example. Yep, so this uh, part, I mean, feature extraction of faces is done uh, directly on the mobile devices of uh, students, of uh, listeners, so we really need uh, to process them on mobile device. Yeah, and that's <laughs> and that's uh, one of the applications which we work together. I, I'm pretty sure that there are uh, other applications uh, which really need it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so thanks for this question, and I believe we need to move to the next presentation. Yeah. So I will um, return to the position of uh, the track chair, and uh, I will um, I will be glad to ask Evgeny Misnikov to introduce his talk. So Evgeny, you are welcome to share your screen. Okay, do you see my uh, presentation? Yeah, we see the PowerPoint, probably you can uh, press F5, yep, or uh, how, 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 how do you? Okay. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So go. Ahead. Thank you very much for your for presenting me. My name is Evgeny Vesnikov. I'm from Samara National Research University and my today's speech is devoted to the uh, dimensionality reduction of hyperspectral data using Hellinger divergence or Hellinger divergence. Uh, I would like to start with uh, the notion of uh, hyperspectral image. Uh, this is a three-dimensional array or coop having two spatial dimensions and one spectral dimension. The spectral dimensionality of hyperspectral images is very high uh, compared to um, usual three channel images. Uh, the number of channel image of channels in uh, hyperspectral images are hundreds. Uh, uh, this high spectral resolution uh, allows us to uh, solve many applied problems with uh, higher quality compared to ordinary images, such as material detection, classification, visualization, outlier detection, and so on. But um, this high spectral resolution also uh, lead us to increased costs of storage, transmission, processing of such images, and so on. So the elimination of redundancy of hyperspectral images is a very important problem uh, and um, this is the topic of today's presentation. Uh, to reduce the dimensionality of hyperspectral images many different techniques uh, have been applied such as feature selection, dimension unsupervised dimensionality reduction, uh, both directions uh, have uh, success in this, but uh, dimensionality reduction techniques are more popular as they do not require uh, the label at set, which are huge and uh, very time consuming. And uh, also, these techniques are more stable to change in the sin. Uh, dimensionality reduction techniques usually divided in linear, such as principal component analysis and nonlinear techniques. And um, the leading technique is the principal component analysis, of course, uh, as it is much more popular. However, uh, nonlinear techniques are also, the popularity of nonlinear techniques are also increasing last years. Uh, nevertheless, they have. Uh, a number of disadvantages, such as long running times, uh, unable to require to recover hyperspectral data, source hyperspectral data, uh, and so on. But uh, they are capable to deal with nonlinear effect effects, uh, which could happen in hyperspectral images due to, for example, water absorption or multipass uh, light scattering, and so on. And also, they are ready to be used with alternative dissimilarity measures which could be also uh, important in hyperspectral image analysis. Uh, we will start with very simple nonlinear mapping technique, uh, which is based on uh, 
the preservation of pairwise Euclidean distances between points. Here on the right uh, side on the slide, you can see you can see the word dimensional dimensionality, which is uh, pointed by dots in three-dimensional space on a surface of a half a cylinder. And uh, the picture in the middle is the result of the principal component analysis. We mapped uh, this data onto a two-dimensional surface, and we can see only global two-dimensional structure, which is a curve and uh, cannot uh, see any local dissimilarities, any, any local distances between the points, and the nonlinear mapping technique allows us to see both global structure and local structure also. Uh, so in this kind of techniques, we usually introduce some data mapping error and use any uh, appropriate uh, optimization technique to reduce this error, for example, gradient descent technique. Um, um, Nonlinear mapping technique um, could be applied in many different ways. For example, in, uh, classification, segmentation, clustering, and also in visualization of hyperspectral images. It is a particular problem because we cannot visualize images with more than three channels on our devices. Uh, so, for example, we can build such uh, pseudo-color representations where the distances between the points in the formed uh, color space approximate uh, the distances in the source multidimensional hyperspectral space. Also, we can visualize uh, th in three, for example, or two dimensions hyperspectral spaces. Um, this is another example. By the way, we expect that uh, Korean members, sorry, uh, Korean members are located on the uh, yens on the in the corners of these uh, point clouds, and Korean members correspond to separate classes or materials which are like which are depicted in the hyperspectral image. Um, in hyperspectral image analysis, uh, researchers uh, apply different dissimilarity measures, not only Euclidean distances, but also um, spectral angle mapper is quite a popular dissimilarity measure. It was also used in a number of papers, in several papers. Uh, with uh, dimensionality reduction techniques. You can see some examples below. Also, the spectral information divergence shows uh, very good results in hyperspectral image analysis. Only several uh, papers used it in uh, hyperspectral dimensionality reduction techniques. You can see these papers on this slide. Uh, but uh, there are researches uh, which show that uh, spectral information divergence is quite good in uh, classification and uh, search for uh, spectral signatures in hyperspectral images. But uh, unfortunately, spectral information divergence uh, is not a metric, is not a true metric, and uh, it is does not satisfy the triangle uniquality. And so uh, many uh, techniques which use this uh, feature of metrics cannot be used with spectral information divergence. For example, we cannot use binary space partitioning tricks to accelerate nearest neighbor searches and class in classification. We cannot use fast cluster, some fast clustering techniques, for example, trimit technique for Kamedoids algorithm and so on. That is why uh, this year uh, we suggested to use Hellinger divergence or Hellinger distance uh, to measure the dissimilarity between uh, points in hyperspectral space. And this uh, distance showed very good results, both in uh, 
the search and the classification of hyperspectral data and in clustering. This uh, distance uh, satisfy all the uh, conditions which we uh, use in uh, which we use uh, when we say about true metrics. So uh, it can be applied in binary space partitioning tricks and other techniques and algorithms to accelerate them and so on. Uh, when we would like to build a dimensional alter reduction technique uh, with uh, some particular metric or some particular dissimilarity measure, we uh, can consider two ways. Uh, the first way is uh, quite uh, straight. We can just treat uh, our dissimilarities or our distances or metrics as a dissimilarity matrix and uh, use the idea coming from multidimensional scaling uh, and approximate these uh, distances with Euclidean distances in the reduced space. Uh, the second way is a bit harder. We can uh, we can uh, introduce some data mapping error and uh, search for analytical gradient of this error and apply, uh, for example, gradient distance technique or some other technique to minimize this error. Uh, for spectral angle preserving, for spectral angle mapping here, uh, the similarity measure. Uh, there was uh, introduced uh, spectral angle preserving mapping, which is shown in this slide. This is a recurrence equation for searching output coordinates of data points in uh, the resulting space. Uh, this uh, particular technique maps uh, the source hyperspectral points onto the unit hypersphere. These are uh, results of this mapping. Uh, Similar technique was introduced for spectral information divergence, and it is called spectral divergence preserving mapping. Uh, this is a solution for the output coordinates in the uh, output space. And in this paper, we do almost the same. We introduce the data mapping error, search for particular derivatives, and uh, obtain the solution for the output coordinates in the reduced space for Hellinger divergence preserving mapping. Unfortunately, uh, poor gradient distance works very slow. Uh, we know it from, for example, neural networks. So here we uh, apply stochastic gradient distance to reduce the computational time and uh, computational complexity of the algorithm. Uh, so uh, these pictures show, uh, show us uh, how the data mapping error uh, changes with iteration. And uh, these uh, numbers show us how we can accelerate uh, the mapping when we apply stochastic gradient descent. Uh, in our experiments, we used uh, two known uh, hyperspectral sense. The first one is the Andean Pines test site, and the second one is Kennedy Space Center. They both were collected with the various sensor. The first one contains uh, 200 spectral bands after um, some bands were discarded. And the second one, 176 bands. Uh, and uh, at first, we studied the workability of both approaches. The first approach uh, is the nonlinear mapping based on the approximation of Hellinger divergence by Euclidean distances. And the second approach is the Hellinger divergence preserving mapping. 
So both approaches works quite good. They reduce the error by an order of amplitude, but um, we uh, noticed that uh, the second approach, the halogen divergence preserving mapping, works bad uh, when mapping to low dimensionalities, for example, two and three. So they rather cannot be used uh, in visualization of hyperspectral images. These are results uh, of the classification accuracy for the nearest neighbor classifier built on the top of uh, several dimensionality reduction techniques. The first column corresponds to principal component analysis. The second column corresponds to nonlinear mapping where we approximate the spectral angles by Euclidean distances. The third one, the third column corresponds to uh, spectral information divergence preserving mapping. The fourth one is the nonlinear mapping based uh, on the approximation of Hellinger divergence by Euclidean distances. And the last column is the Hellinger divergence preserving mapping. So uh, two last techniques are proposed in, the, in this paper. And um, I should remind that uh, the main purpose is to replace the spectral divergence, the spectral information divergence with Hellinger divergence to compare our um, proposed techniques with SDPM. As we see for the Indian Pines image, uh, Hellinger divergence preserving mapping uh, works uh, similar to SDPM, that is, uh, it works bad for lower dimensionalities. Here it is, uh, the dimensionality is shown on the horizontal axis, so we uh, obtain very low accuracy. And with the growth of the dimensionality, these techniques show similar results and the best results on this image. Uh, on the second image of the case C, uh, they also show similar results. But here we um, see um, that the PCA works very bad for the dimensionality up to 20. And uh, the results are substantially lower than for nonlinear techniques, which we used in this paper. So, uh, if I have a bit of time, I can uh, show one more slide. This is a prelim these are preliminary results. The first result uh, is the image obtained using the approximation of Hellinger divergence by Euclidean distances. Uh, and uh, I should say that it is uh, quite far from natural. Uh, the, the colors in this image are quite far from natural, but uh, we did not uh, do any additional, any post-processing to uh, linear transform these colors so that they approximate uh, the colors which we used to see on such type of images. So these are preliminary results. So I would like to ask you to understand me. <laughs> what, and and these uh, two images show uh, a visualiz the visualization of hyperspectral space uh, using this technique. As we can see, we can, can obtain, we can uh, see different point clouds uh, colored with different colors coming from, uh, these colors are, come from true classification of this data. So at least we see that there is some correlation, there is some sense to use these techniques also for these purposes, but this is ongoing work. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I would like to answer. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Evgeny. Uh, any question? 
Okay, um, probably I have a small question um, to you. So, um, do you have some, uh, have, have you tried something related uh, with dimension net reduction related to, I don't know, some auto encoders or some neural networks uh, with uh, unsupervised or semi supervised pre training? Yes, I, I yes. Thank you very much, Andre, for your question. We indeed uh, have several possibilities in uh, neural network uh, infrastructure to reduce the dimensionality. And the first one is both, both, uh, both of two uh, are quite old. The first one is an encoder, which uh, is former auto associative neural networks. Yes. Um, and the second one is uh, Cajonian net neural networks or self-organizing maps. Uh, I will start with the second one. It is indeed used for dimensionality reduction. Uh, I uh, should uh, recall that uh, this is a network uh, in which we have uh, one layer. Uh, where neurons are placed in the corners of uh, of a grid. So uh, if we have uh, one dimensional grid, then we can reduce to one dimension. For two dimensional grids, uh, we can reduce to two dimensions. But anyway, uh, we obtain a discretized uh, space, a discretized output space. Uh, so in many, many papers, researchers uh, use a post-processing such as salmon mapping or so on to map the resulting uh, neurons onto the, uh, onto the uh, visualization plane. Um, the first uh, approach you recall is uh, autoencoder. This is a very promising approach, I think, but I see uh, here several, uh, several issues. The first one is we need to somehow learn the architecture of such network. Uh, uh, on the one hand, we can, for example, increase the number of neurons and uh, reduce the error up to close to zero values. Uh, but also we lose in uh, we lose in uh, aggregation properties of such network. Uh, and uh, the time which is needed to uh, solve this task is very, very high, um, uncomparable to what we have in uh, the, the sort of techniques which I discuss in this paper. Uh, but uh, autoencoders or auto-associative neural networks have a big uh, big advantage over other nonlinear techniques. This advantage is they provide us with both uh, direct and uh, um, abruptly. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Um, with both direct and inverse uh, transformation, which uh, is almost uh, in analytical form because you have neurons, you have architecture, that means you have um, functions with weights. So you always uh, can return to the hyperspectral space, the source hyperspectral space with some small maybe or maybe big uh, error. So I think this is a, this is a direction which is needed to be explored. But also I think um, that in fact, 
uh, there would be a problem of interpreting the results of this uh, network. Uh, I mean, uh, the output of encoder should be somehow interpreted where this uh, poor signatures should be uh, placed and so on. So I think more research needed uh, to approve uh, that this type of algorithms are useful in this task. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, probably no question. So uh, I have a, just a short comment that you mentioned that uh, there are some problems with using fast uh, approximate nearest neighbor, neighbor search methods if uh, the distance dissimilarity is not metric, but there are some libraries like non-metric space library, which can be used in this case, I'm just for your, <laughs> just for your attention. So, okay. Uh, but it's just a comment. So thanks for, uh, for presentation. Uh, Thank you. There is a link in the chat. Okay, and nevertheless, so I propose that every every participants are online for for our track. So I propose to skip the coffee break because we are out of schedule and to continue to with the next uh, speech. I believe it will be Yuri um, Ganeva. Um, yep, and uh, the, uh, the paper devoted to Iris uh, personal recognition. So uh, if I'm right and uh, Yulia is here you can present uh, you can add the uh, presentation and share it i see you is here but i can't hear you yeah. No, 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 Yulia. The question is, we are out of schedule. Can you start right now? Because we actually need to start, had to start five minutes ago. <laughs>
You can start. So you're welcome. Uh, uh, good day. My name is Yuda Ganeva. Uh, today I want to present my report uh, on the topic of uh, development of a method for iris based uh, uh, person recognition uh, using convolutional neural network. Um, uh, iris identification is uh, one of the most accurate and uh, reliable biometric identification methods uh, as uh, the iris uh, texture is uh, remarkably stable over time. Uh, on this slide, you can see images and... Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, one second. Um, uh, this is a sclera, this is a iris, uh, this is pupil. Um, this slide provides a summary of the selected data set. The NMURS uh, database was used to uh, data state uh, of virus images. Uh, the database uh, contains uh, five images for the left and uh, right eyes uh, of uh, 35 uh, people, uh, which gives a total of uh, 4,050 uh, images. Uh, the problem of multi-class classification is uh, being solved uh, where the number of classes is uh, 35. Uh, to evaluate the quality of segmentation uh, stage, all database images uh, were manually uh, segmented. Um, this slide um, uh, pro, uh, the slides show uh, uh, the iris based uh, person recognition pipeline uh, that we use in our work. Uh, it consists of the following uh, steps uh, um, image preprocessing, uh, segmentation, normalization, future extractions, and uh, classification. Uh, in uh, many works, uh, the diagonal method, uh, how uh, transform and does uh, used uh, to segment the uh, iris of uh, the eye. Uh, the normalization step uh, in many works is implemented uh, over transformation of localized uh, region of the um, iris from a Cartesian uh, coordinate system uh, to a polar coordinate system. Um, uh, to extract feature in many works, used uh, Gabor filter, uh, log Gabor filter, uh, Kazan transform, and DASA. Um, also, um, in some work, after future extractions, uh, used uh, step or a data dimension uh, resolution. Uh, and the um, final step uh, is classification uh, in many works uh, using uh, machine uh, learning algorithms such as um, support vector machine with other kernels, uh, random forest uh, algorithm, uh, the boost uh, classifier, uh, and the Kanye's neighborhood algorithm. Um, Previously, uh, we proposed a method uh, of the segmentation of uh, iris images uh, using a convolution neural networks uh, architecture unit. Uh, to improve the segmentation quality, we uh, selected the most suitable uh, hyperparameters for training a neural network, uh, namely a learning rate and a batch size. Um, learning rate selected from um, and 10 to minus uh, third power, 10 to minus uh, four power, e, and uh, uh, 10 uh, to minus uh, five power. And uh, batch size selected from uh, 20, uh, 10, uh, and uh, 30. Uh, the most suitable hyperparameters for training neural networks uh, turn it out uh, to be a learning rate of uh, 10 to uh, minus 4 power and a batch size of 30. Um, when expanding the training data set, biometric transformation were used, um, such as uh, random cropping uh, of the image uh, vertically and horizontally, um, rotating uh, the image uh, by random angles, uh, brightness transformation, um, and uh, other transformation. Um, were used uh, on original images. Um, also, you can see um, an example of segmentation uh, on the right um, part of uh, this slide. Uh, left uh, columns is uh, original images, um, middle is this, uh, true mass segmentation, and uh, right is segmentation result using convolutional neural network. Um, in our work, uh, we um, 
uh, consider two, uh, two approach for data normalization. Uh, the first approach uh, to normalization was uh, proposed uh, by Daldman. Uh, it helps uh, embed people uh, construction duration. Um, to essence, uh, the approach is um, uh, to convert a localized heuristic tool from a Cartesian coordinate system to a polar coordinate system. Uh, as um, a result of the conversion, you can uh, see uh, on number one uh, this. Um, the second approach uh, is the sequence of the following steps uh, is uh, cropping uh, of the localized um, iris. Uh, and uh, zooms uh, the cropped images to uh, to uh, to thousand to hundred twenty four to to hundred twenty four. Uh, the number two shows the result of this approach. Um, in this work, we uh, study uh, and um, compare it to the following feature systems. Uh, first feature systems is uh, hand craft features, uh, is traditional uh, filters uh, computer vision, uh, such as uh, uh, 2D Gabor filter, 1D Gabor filters, and 2D low Gabor filters. And uh, the features uh, is um, the procedure for extracting the features. Uh, representation with convolutional neural networks uh, consists uh, in uh, turning off uh, the last layer in uh, pre-training uh, uh, convolutional neural networks for iris recognition and um, placing uh, the data through the modify uh, neural network. Um, after, after extracting uh, the feature representation uh, data, uh, a dimensional reduction steps is traditionally introduced. Uh, in our work, we used most popular uh, dimension uh, reduction uh, technique, uh, AI principle uh, component analysis. Um, to solve uh, the classification problem, uh, we use uh, uh, algorithms from uh, machine learning is the CM or with a uh, uh, linear um, polynomial um, a radial basis uh, kernel, uh, random forest, and the uh, car new neighborhoods algorithm. Uh, also, we uh, used uh, accuracy metrics for um, estimation uh, result uh, our uh, methods. Uh, formula presented on this uh, slide. Uh, the reported study solves the uh, um, following task, uh, determine the best, uh, the best normalization techniques, uh, choose uh, the best uh, feature uh, extraction method uh, from the previous slide, uh, estimate the best um, destination size for dimensional resolution uh, stage, and uh, choose uh, the best uh, classification uh, techniques uh, from the slide. Uh, also, we uh, um, in process training, we use a cross-validation mechanism was used to train and access the quality of the methods. Uh, the, data, the data set uh, split um, uh, into five uh, clusters. Uh, this each uh, iteration of cross-validation uh, for subset uh, were submitted for training and uh, one cluster used uh, for testing. Um, the average uh, accuracy is uh, final accuracy our methods. Mm. Uh, on this slide, uh, we, uh, we see uh, first part uh, result experimental research. Uh, this result on uh, two dimensional uh, Gabor filters um, uh, was used as the first feature extraction techniques uh, after normalization by uh, Meta Dogman uh, and instruction of the feature representation, the dimensional reduction. Uh, one uh, dimensional and two dimensional logobar filters uh, because uh, became the next uh, um, uh, method for feature extraction. Uh, and um, this result we uh, use. Um, SVM classifica classificator with uh, linear or BF sigmoid and polynomial uh, kernels. Uh, this slide presents uh, two part uh, result uh, experimental research. Uh, and um, um, 
this uh, result uh, with uh, using uh, uh, two dimensional Gabor filter, one dimensional log Gabor filter, and two dimensional log Gabor filter with uh, 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 algorithms random forest, uh, can it neighbor first uh, for classification. Um, and considering neural network method for feature extraction and modified uh, pre-training neural networks uh, of the Inception V3 uh, architecture and um, um, DenseNet uh, 121. Uh, the procedure for these techniques uh, was the following uh, normalization uh, of the original images by the endowment method uh, with using Inception V3, uh, feature extraction using uh, pre-training uh, model uh, for uh, classification iris um, and uh, um, apply dimensionally reduction method, uh, we uh, get uh, this result. Uh, the final pitch extraction techniques uh, was a pre-training um, convolutional neural networks of the architecture dense net. Uh, normalization was performed by uh, dropping and scaling. Uh, all sub uh, segments uh, step were similar of uh, those uh, with uh, Inception V3. Uh, the result for neural network uh, based feature systems and the same algorithms uh, we can uh, see on this slide. And uh, this slide uh, this is the result for neural networks based approach. Pitchy um, systems and uh, KNN and random forest uh, algorithms um, for classification. Uh, as uh, can be seen, uh, the best classification quality was uh, provided using uh, dense net uh, architecture um, and uh, amount at uh, 99.78%. Uh, um, in uh, this uh, case, uh, the framing and scaling approach were used to uh, normalization. Uh, the optimal number of uh, PCA component is uh, uh, 128. Uh, and the optimal classifier is uh, support vector uh, machine with a uh, uh, sigmoidal uh, kernel, uh, this result. And uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. So, any question to Yulia? Uh, probably I have some questions. So, um, you say that you use the neural networks pre-trained. So, they were pre-trained on ImageNet or on some iris data set because there are plenty of iris data sets, large data sets, you can use them. Um, per training neural networks uh, on the MMPRS uh, data state. Um, uh, we train this neural network uh, in uh, our uh, um, previous uh, research. Um, and we use uh, this uh, data set because uh, we have uh, uh, easy access uh, to data set and uh, we have um, uh, segmentation masks uh, as a data set uh, uh, not have uh, easy access and um, um, some data sets um, uh, not have uh, segmentation masks. Um, uh, we uh, previously um, decision uh, task uh, segmentation. Yeah, I see, but my question is, did, did you use the neural network pre-trained on ImageNet? No. Uh, so you have two data sets. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and the first one, which was used to pre-train it, what is the how what, what is the statistics of the data set? So what is what is the data set used to pre-train the neural network? Uh, we uh, use MMU iris uh, data set. Uh, but it's used for not pre-training. It's used for yes, not it's used for classification. Uh, yes, for classification. But it's not pre-training. <laughs> yes, this is previously um, uh, work. Uh, we use uh, uh, some augmentation um, for um, dimensionally uh, large uh, uh, data set uh, size. Okay, um, and probably my other question. 
Um, uh, did you compare your results with some existing papers uh, for this data set? Because I see on your, <laughs> your own result, I mean, on your experiments. So does anyone work with this data set? Do you have some? Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, on this data set, uh, I have a um, small amount of work and uh, we um, not uh, compare with uh, another works. Um. Okay, I see. Any other question? Mm -hmm. So let's thank Julia for her presentation. Probably we can move to the next speaker. I believe it will be Ilya Makarov with uh, outfit recommendation using visual similarity. Ilya, are you here? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Hi, everybody. Okay. So, do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So, you can share your presentation. Yes, just a moment. So, do you see the screen? Yeah, yeah, excellent. Go ahead. Okay, then uh, I have two talks in a row, basically. So, I hope you will not be too bored from listening uh, to me. So, the first talk is mostly about computer vision, and we'll talk about um, our work. Um, from HSC about outfit recommendation using visual similarity. Uh, so basically, <clears throat> for this problem, we have the purpose, uh, I mean, to answer the questions, what item of clothing should be chosen from the proposed one so that it implements the outfit well. So you could say that uh, fashion stylists and designers that try to make an outfit uh, fitting not only visual, uh, uh, I mean, some visual properties of human, but also trying to complement each other by uh, some style, uh, color, I don't know, design elements, uh, combination of uh, different type of clothes and maybe some accessories and so on. And uh, basically we have two questions to, uh, to be discussed. So one is uh, if we have some numbered clothes or garments uh, which we want to evaluate, so uh, whether they complement each other and could we score this. And second problem is just when we have the current outfit, could we add some uh, last missing detail or last missing uh, garment and this task is called fill in the blank. Um, so basically uh, this answer, uh, it's uh, to determine the compatibility of a set of clothing items that uh, uh, could be extended by one item, for example, to be complete and uh, uh, compatible uh, with each other. So examples of outfit could be seen here. So for example, you have some clothes, accessories, shoes, uh, bags, and so on. And for example, here are some examples uh, for compatibility predictions. So for example, when you have something like uh, gray, uh, I mean gray, black and white, black and uh, light pink uh, shoes and light uh, pink bag, it gets high compatibility score because usually pink and uh, white is uh, mu much, it's much each other from the stylish point of view. So again, I'm not expert in this, in this field, but I could just say that, I mean, watching some movies, you could see uh, this, this kind of styles uh, quite usable. And for example, having a combination of yellow, uh, yellow short with a green back and, uh, uh, something like brown or dark gray, uh, uh, um, the lower part of, of, of the clothes, I mean, it, it gets you very low, very low compatibility score. And for example, also just mixing uh, some uh, short with another short, I mean, it's, 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 it's ridiculous and it's uh, not appearing in data sets. In those cases, uh, they usually meet it and get low score. So basically, <clears throat> There are a lot of approaches that try to tackle this problem. So for example, one of the earliest approaches just do pairwise similarity. And the problem is that it lacks overall good looking quality for the outfit. So when you could match every, uh, every type of object with each other, you could get some very limited number of outfits that match together ideally. But I mean, usually you may have uh, needed to fit the car to fit the current number of garments with some additional ones, and they may not be ideally to each other. Uh, there are also approaches based on SAMS architectures, but they usually were fitting because uh, there is a lack of, um, lack of data regarding good outfits for this kind of training. And for content-based ranking and recommend the system, there were several uh, papers, including papers presented in ICE conference. So in general, it works good, but lack of balance between session-based and content-based recommendations. So basically, I mean, when you're trying to extend your outfit, uh, you may uh, 
uh, overfit either for user preference or what they are choosing, or you may have uh, overfit, for example, for uh, something which is related only to style components and not tackle uh, overall statistics in general. Uh, and uh, there is some back in, in, in PDF, but basically slice the results approach is based on PLSTM for sequence processing, but the problem is that uh, Usually it's like there is no order or sequence in the outfit data set, so it's hard to say how it should be properly trained. So at least there need some modifications of uh, uh, BLSTM, which I didn't under the order of uh, items, so it will, it will be trained good. So overall, structural and content-based features play a crucial role in this task, and the idea is to use uh, some structural, basically graph representation for outfit uh, compatibility. So in our study, we decided to limit ourselves for uh, visual features alone for garments, and for them, we use Google Net Inception V3 architecture for extracting garment embeddings. So, uh, then for each outfit that could be presented, uh, I mean, in some stylish form, uh, we extract uh, garments IDs and basically uh, constructed a uh, uh, constructed graph which uh, uh, just says that uh, two nodes uh, representing each garment are connected if they appear in some of the outfits. Of course, uh, aligning many outfits uh, could result in overlapping edges. So in these cases, there are two approaches that we also tested. Uh, so the simplest approach is just to, I mean, if uh, uh, some combinations appear more than once, then just uh, make them as an edge. And another approach is just to make weights for the edges. So basically, more, more outfits containing pairs of items, and it means like more similar there, and we could, we could weight them. Uh, if we go to the fashion outfit data sets, uh, we used Polyvor data set, which is a popular uh, fashion site that has been used by stylists uh, <laughs> until it was bought uh, by multi-brand retailer and then was closed, but still it retains uh, a number of uh, outfits that were created by uh, designers and stylists, so usually uh, these data sets contain some I mean, visual representation, which we don't take into account, uh, because, I mean, that's more about some uh, content stylistic cases for uh, attracting humans. But what we do here, we take images. Uh, we don't take any kind of text categories uh, and so on, uh, but just consider the visual information alone. We do a number of pre-processing, uh, basically by cleaning categories that are not garments uh, or that are rare or uh, left in outfits which contain at least three elements and at most eight elements. So a very large number, number of uh, clothes and accessories in the outfit was 6.2 in the clean data sets. Basically about training details. So we have two tasks. So one is outfit uh, compatibility prediction. So in this case, we take uh, garment embeddings from inception and then we concatenate them and fill with zeros for empty element positions. Uh, so we can see this, that we have eight positions uh, at maximum. So like we'll just uh, feed the positions so which we don't have uh, uh, any kind of information by zeros. And we train the set uh, um, using the training set of positive examples. And to create negative, uh, negative examples, we randomly replace one item in each compatible garment with a random closing item of the same category. Uh, for the fill, uh, fill in the blank uh, task, we uh, basically do the following stuff. So we take the positive outfits, mask one element, and add three negative samples with less compatibility score for outfit. Uh, so the task will be to predict missing positions uh, uh, versus uh, training versus fixed number of negative samples. So basically, I, I don't I don't think that uh, the current statement for how to solve uh, fill in the blank position is the optimal one, as was mentioned also by reviewers. But in general, I would rather say that uh, if we train the model well for compatibility prediction score, you could also train something like one versus all classifiers to predict uh, the proper proper position of one element, and then you could, uh, for, for example, consequently apply this uh, this kind of model. Uh, for predicting the best chain of, uh, of uh, sequences for adding uh, elements to the outfit. Uh, otherwise, you could also do some kind of grid source based on just solving the first task and just trying to uh, fill the empty position with uh, maximizing the overall outfit compatibility score. 
So, uh, based on our graph representation, we decided to use already well-known model. So we apply graph sage, graph and pebbings, which is basically graph neural networks. Uh, it uh, follows the idea that uh, if we have some information in the graph of these clauses that are related to each other based on the uh, simultaneous uh, appearance in, in, in some outfit. So we could uh, get some information from the neighbors and that's pretty much the idea of uh, graph neural network. So we have some aggregation function, which in our case was chosen just taking the value from the uh, embeddings of our neighbors. And the model just uh, learned some weights with concatenated vector of uh, self-representation of a node and aggregated message from their neighbors. Um, basically, this task could be trained in two manners. So one is link prediction on output graph, and uh, uh, that's, that's the first loss function. So basically, you want to predict that uh, vertices that are connected to each other uh, have close embeddings, and uh, uh, compared to uh, randomly chosen negative samples, uh, they are far from each other. And if you want to train, for example, in supervised or semi-supervised manner, when we have some compatibility scores, for example, that could be computed by other methods or could be stored, I mean, from uh, uh, from our data sets and from other approaches, then you could just train via using cross-entropy with some regularization of weights of the loss of a car. So for the first task uh, regarding compatibility score, we uh, uh, didn't outperform uh, the best, uh, the best uh, simple approach, which takes information not only from visual, but also text and labels, but we were close enough uh, regarding rockout metrics. And for uh, fit B score, we outperform existing approaches. Uh, again, it may be uh, just because we have limited the number of uh, uh, positive and negative samples for this task, but we, I mean, we believe that's a proper direction to study this in the, in the future work because uh, what we showed that uh, considering this task as classification for missing, missing position is uh, uh, pretty good and it outperforms significantly some recurrent methods or even CMS networks uh, which try to consider some metric learning or sequential approaches. So in this case, we show that I'm just considering not classification from the graph point of view and the graph representation so good benefits, but overall compatibility score uh, obtained from these cases may be a little bit lacking compared to more general approaches. And as for visual results, you could see some compatibility scores for different different outfits. So, for example, we already show that in taking some similar I mean similar uh, similar clothes uh, will result to very low compatibility scores. Also, we may see some. Uh, inconsistency in styles, for example, here, uh, and uh, uh, in general, it's like, I would just say that this kind of system, they could be deployed in production in very easy, straightforward manner. So as soon as you, as you have a number of data and you feel people, designers, stylists to create this, uh, this kind of information, then you could collect, uh, extract the graph representation and finally train the model to do predictions like people do. Uh, of course, it makes some bias for, uh, for overall model, but if uh, you have a, a lot of people who are doing this kind of stuff, for example, uh, if you know that there is online shop, uh, which is called Shane, and there is an opportunity to, for registered account to create these outfits, uh, just, just by creating and seeing other cre creators' uh, outfits, you could uh, buy more uh, more clothes uh, in one in one case, more accessories. I mean, just in, in by buying, so you increase uh, uh, the profit from the shop, and you, and you also get the data what you really like. So, that, so it could be personalized. Again, we didn't study personal personalized data for us users because you know, we don't have uh, uh, we don't have access to this kind of information. But anyway, it's like it's really possible to make it in general working quite good and uh, also personalized, just paying attention for uh, exact user and uh, outfits that he or she likes uh, the most. So basically, as a conclusion for um, the first talk, we uh, proves that graph uh, representation of fashion outfit can help build in fashion recommendations. So we didn't uh, perform uh, the task of uh, compatibility uh, scoring, uh, but we showed that simple aggregating graph of garments is enough to achieve high quality in fit B uh, task. And uh, uh, basically, again, novel attention based inductive uh, graph neural network can further improve the quality in downstream task. So I would like to thank for. Listening to the first presentation, and I'm ready to answer your question.
Yeah, okay, thanks, Elia. Um, any questions about this topic? Okay, so as usual, I have some questions. So, um, first of all, you mentioned um, that you extracted features using Inception v3 network. So, can you um, say how do you choose this backbone? Just to some ideas why 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 this backbone not something I don't know like visual transformers so <laughs> efficient. Yeah, I mean it's something. like you, you know it's as part of uh, this work was partially student by bachelor. Uh, we have a bachelor student, uh, and she didn't have access, I mean, to good computational resources. So from this point of view, we just take already pre-trained networks and just test it on our data sets, which performs the best in, in very simple verification procedures. So in this case, I'm not, I'm not sure that this is the best option, but I would rather say that uh, uh, it's quite, I mean, it's quite uh, good to experiment with other uh, image embedding techniques, but uh, our idea was in general just by taking some pre-trained model, you could extract meaningful embeddings for garments, even not pre-training on something like deep fashion data sets or again, early world data sets. And uh, of course, it could be further improved with uh, fine tuning to exact fashion data sets. It could be improved by choosing more, more advanced architectures. So our idea was that just to prove that we don't need for example, for fit B task, we don't need to really uh, pay a lot of information to multi-model data, such as labels, text, and images, but we could just build well-working model only uh, based only on visual information law. And for this kind of thing, I consider that uh, inception may work quite well because uh, the features that we really need is some kind of texture patterns and also color styles uh, and their consistency across one garment. They're enough to, to be encoded in this representation uh, to perform well in the downstream task. Okay, thanks. Um, and probably one other question from me. So you presented um, actually two experiments, yep. Uh, in one of them, you have a really good um, increase of the competitors of accuracy is higher than, I don't know, nine or some sort of 10%, yep. And then another experiment you have slightly uh, a lower quality when compared to competitors. So um, can you uh, discuss for, for the range audience of uh, our conference, what is the difference in these um, experiments in these experimental settings and uh, what is, uh, so just understand how good is your method and uh, in, what, um, in what application it can be used. Because I mean, yeah, it's like in, now, in yeah. simple words, in simple words, you, if you just miss one outfit, so for example, you already buy a lot and you want to miss, I mean, you miss some, I don't know, some, some head, for example, or some accessory, or I don't know, you don't know what, what the short to consider that, that will be fitting to your back and your head, then our methods in fit B task uh, perform quite good. But regarding overall compatibility score, again, we have non-consistent results and I mean, we'll lack, uh, lack something in quality because Maybe it's not. It was not. Uh, uh, um, it wasn't properly studied how to do attention in this kind of networks and whether as a weighted component or weighted network representation or unweighted is the best is the best choice here. So I would rather say that predicting uh, for randomly chosen items, predicting their compatibility score is quite hard because the number of uh, positive samples is still lacking compared to the all the possible combinations. And there is no much clear scenario how you could generate negative samples. So we just follow procedures that were suggested in other papers and we receive, I mean, some, some worse results compared to them. Maybe we, we need to follow some other procedure for generating negative samples for these outfits and dive into details about how, from, I mean, from the fashion point of view, what really is said to be, to be bad outfit. And from this position, maybe we, we, we may also have some improvement of a uh, randomly chosen uh, uh, set uh, of uh, clothes and score it. Yeah, okay, thanks. Are the questions? Yeah. Uh, okay. So basically, can... if you already if you already if you already choose some uh, in some close combinations and they are they are good, so you have style, then we'll be able to predict what what will be the last missing option for you. Well, so I would rather say, I mean, if you if you don't have a style at all, I can see that our good results in B also will not help you just from the 
position of how we train this model. But I would, I would rather say that most people have have this kind of style style of option, but it could be further improved by our model. Ah, so you plus, can plus, use it on the even if you forgot to buy two things, not one but two or three. Oh well, yeah, yeah well, of course you could choose it. I mean, if you could use it in in this equational manner, yeah. But still, again, if you miss too much, so for example, if you just start with two options, there are too much options of how you could complement it. And I'm not sure that this kind of greedy extending procedure will result in the best uh, final outfit. Okay, thanks. So I, I propose to move to the next speech again from you. <laughs> yeah, but uh, about a different topic of deep reinforcement learning and wisdom. So yeah, games. And you're welcome. Okay, so let, let me again check whether you see my screen. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would rather say that this talk will be much more technical and I mean, dive into details. So we'll talk about transformer based data deep reinforcement learning in Bizdoom. And uh, this uh, joint work uh, supported by HSE University and also Artificial Intelligence Research Institute. Uh, so now I will not uh, dive into details about uh, how reinforcement learning works and in general, I mean, it's very hard to make a presentation on this topic because you, have, you need to take a lot of theory to discuss, but I'll just mostly focus on the main I mean, main, main points of our work and what we try to test. So basically, we already know that transformers, uh, transformers is a novel neural network architecture that's successfully used in many sequential tasks. And uh, many reinforcement learning tasks could be uh, uh, could be formulated as, uh, I mean, also modeling of sequence. So basically, you have state, action, and reward. And there are various current papers that try to somehow modify rewards and just train transformers uh, on these uh, sequences of state action rewards, uh, which uh, learns to some good policies. And in general, it's also interesting to see how you could encode not only these sequences, but also how, how you should encode the states. And in this tool, which is basically environment for 3D first person shooter, you have uh, uh, consequence screenshots from the game environments, you may or may not have some enemies. And the question is how to encode this information just uh, to efficiently uh, train reinforcement learning methods. And in this work, we combine transformer architecture with uh, reinforcement learning and train them in this Doom game environment. And we uh, uh, show the comparison of different architecture with respect to convolutional and record models. So basically, regarding with those scenarios, I just placed three examples of this scenario. So for example, you have some I mean, very basic scenario in which uh, the number of reactions is limited. You have defense, uh, the center scenario in which you are players uh, staying inside one circle and you, need, you can rotate uh, and change the position of your aiming position. You need to kill the enemies that are running to you until you are out of armor. In the health gathering scenario, you need to collect uh, health packs uh, to survive because there is exit in the floor and your health is constantly draining. Uh, and there are much more, much more number of scenarios that I will explain later. So in general, uh, final uh, final goal is to, of course, to play as a human in this much scenario when every agent is uh, competing with uh, any other. And this is kind of final goal for all, all the scenarios, I would say. And what we aim to test is that we take uh, A to C reinforcement learning model and try to test different combinations for encoders in this task. So basically, you have transformer, which takes uh, uh, first, uh, several number of convolutions and uh, uh, of uh, one secret number of frames that we align just vertically. And after that, uh, we used flattening and position encoding before feeding to transform a layer uh, with uh, tension mechanism. In LSTM, you do uh, similar stuff with uh, starting with convolution layers, but then feeding them to LSTM layers. And finally, for purely convolutional architecture, you add some number of uh, other convolutions, flatten them, and uh, train the final results with some number of uh, fully connected layers. Um, we have two, uh, two options to discuss. So one is, okay, let's test transformers versus convolutions versus LSTM. And in our base model, Again, as I've spoken before, 
will have input and frames combined vertically, as I've had to sequence of convolutional layers and send flat and produce a single flat vector corresponding to the whole frame. And usually this encoded frame would be considered a single transformal CLS token, uh, similar to how BERT is trained. Thus, the whole input sequence for the transformer would be defined using this temporal, temporal dimension. And the second goal is that we have a number of papers on transformers that suggest some different modifications with respect to reinforcement learning and other techniques, and we test different transformers by considering four modifications that we'll discuss in details. So I am uh, originally want to apologize because we have a number of texts discussing this modification. It's very hard to compress them and to, to present all the formulas in a simple way. So the first modification, which is called basically order player norm, uh, which allows an identity map from the input of the first encoder layer to the output of the last layer. So basically the idea is the following, that uh, we have near zero layers normalization, which uh, coupled with this uh, reorder procedure allows encoder to pass the input reservation to the actor and critic heads, which are used in reinforcement learning agents. And, uh, this kind of information will be more or less unchanged from, 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 the, from the model architecture in this case. And this kind of trick allows uh, actual critic learn Markovian policy at the beginning. So basically learning some simple reactive behaviors much more quick, uh, quickly and it's quite similar how it works in vision transformers as well. A second modification, which is called gated transformer, reportedly should have stabilized uh, the model and improved its total performance by the use of gated techniques from gated recurrent units. And this gating mechanism just replaces original residual connections. And uh, reportedly in previous studies, it increases the stability of the model, but uh, uh, unfortunately in our studies, uh, we'll later show that it doesn't affect so much um, as it was reported in, in the simplest, uh, in the supposed environments compared to 3D environment. The third modification is basically, okay, let's consider vision transformers with different number of patches. So if you are not familiar with vision transformers, they basically split the image uh, uh, input images into a square grid of image patches. So basically let's divide the image by many small patches and a single patch then will be a separate token providing the special dimension. And since we can see the, not a single frame, but a sequence of last frames, then we should both uh, special and temporal information and applying positional encodings. So in this work, we just use very, uh, again, due to computational constraints on, on our resources in which we need to train our agents. And again, it's like the training, uh, uh, training number of iterations is measured in tens of millions. So in this work, we just uh, use a simple computation of uh, sequences of patch from the consequent frames. Also, we could uh, separate positional embeddings and it could be possibly computed and combined with different element-wise uh, operations such as summation or maximum or something like this. And finally, the first modification kind of without CLS token. So uh, the idea is the following. So you could really remove the CLS token, which is prepended to the input sequence and is fed into the transformer. So basically, prepared to this token is the originally intended way to solve classification task using used on transformers and especially like in the examples of BERT and vision transformers. And the important representation of this token is fed into a feed forward head of heads, which are then trained for classification or regression task. In our cases, this token increases the total sequence length, and its usage is arguably not necessary because in many cases, the last element of the sequence, so basically the current frame, is the most recent frame, most likely contains the most useful information for the edges. For example, in the current frame, some enemy appears, then of course this information will be much more useful compared to the previous frame in which there were no, no enemy uh, uh, in the vicinity of uh, player's view or something like this. So our comparison results in the following results. So we have, uh, we have trained uh, all the agents with uh, 20 millions of iterations and uh, report mean reverse, mean reward for modification in health gathering scenario. So it's the simplest scenario in which you just need to collect health packs again trying to survive as long as possible. So in this case, you could see that, uh, first of all, uh, our modification are better than baseline model and uh, usually uh, uh, usually taking the first modification is better than just taking. Uh, so basically having this residual connections of, uh, of the input uh, improves the performance of uh, transformer architecture. Uh, then secondly, that uh, Switching to gated transformers doesn't affect uh, this model in general at all. Also, we compared that vision transformers with smaller patches, 
uh, perform uh, much much worse compared to vision transformers with the larger patches. But the tendency is the following. If you can uh, continue to increase the size of patches, uh, in the end, you'll just have something like a, uh, MLP uh, for, for the image domain, which are very hard to train. In our case, we also have I mean, the number of problems for training these models, and uh, it's very hard to train uh, transformers with uh, large, large sizes. Uh, so basically, in general, it usually slows down the training significantly. And the fourth modification of removing CLS tokens really uh, sped up uh, sped up the training. So basically, for all the other experiments, we just take this modification and consider this, this uh, one of the I mean one of the most efficient ways to speed up the overall training, considering transformer architecture again when we have res uh, constrained resources. Finally, let me discuss some uh, results of comparison transformer convolution and uh, LSTM uh, based. Uh, uh, models in different scenarios. So for health gathering scenario, we, and, and again, for all the five scenarios that I will discuss, we report max rewards and mean rewards. Uh, uh, so just to to show you the differences in different policies learned by our agents. So you could see that um, uh, in this case, it's convolutional architecture significantly uh, uh, significantly underperform compared to the other cases, and, and the difference between transformer and LSTM models are almost negligible. So the regional position of LSTM learns much, much better policy compared to transformers. And uh, but this that is for maximum reward. If we can see the familiar ones that are more or less uh, report uh, better situations. So in this case, you you would just say that on the average. Uh, LSTM and transformers learn temporal component almost the same, but starting from some position, uh, some point, uh, transformer architecture perform much better, and only then later converges to point similar to LSTM. In my way home, which is quite complex scenario uh, in which uh, the agent is uh, randomly positioned inside the uh, similar uh, similar rooms and need to find the armor to kind of get maximum reward and uh, uh, exit uh, out of the maze. So in these cases, we show that evolutional architecture we are, uh, and basically LSTM outperform transformer architecture. And it was quite interesting because both LSTM and uh, convolutional uh, encoders uh, provide the behavior for, for agents so that it's quite clumsy, try to uh, uh, repeat many actions and the LSTM we may not find at all uh, some policies, but again, transformer behavior may be just from lack of it, if, if it's opportunity for zero shot or few shot learning, it just could not, uh, couldn't lo locate itself and uh, engine and repeating just some similar stuff and not trying to properly explore the environment. Uh, maybe just from the lack of data, maybe training too much much more number of iterations and random seeds uh, may improve this performance. But in this scenario, we show the transform slack compared to the other architectures. Uh, in the scenario, defense the center in which the agent is staying. So we see that transformers significantly outperform those baselines starting from some point. Uh, it's, uh, also, the same thing goes uh, in the deadly corridor setting. So in the deadly corridor setting, you need to go through a straight line and the uh, enemies appears from, from the left and the right, right sides. So you need to uh, hit them like in first person movie do if you see it. So it's quite similar to this kind of thing. And you could also see that despite the maximum reward, I'm more or less the same with the LSTM uh, model. So in, in the overall performance, you see that again, transformer based models uh, outperform LSTM based on the on this scenario and for convolutional architecture, they they do not train at all in this setting. So it means that it's quite hard to distinguish uh, positions of enemies and fixed, uh, more or less fixed uh, corridor with uh, shifted positions uh, just by using local methods based on convolutions. And finally, uh, regarding the main the main results, this much, uh, unfortunately, we showed that uh, uh, in the most complex scenario, uh, we see some uh, some good performance of transformer-based architectures in the initial steps, and they can uh, consistently outperform convolutional approaches, but learning LSTM shows the best performance in this much scenario. But it also means that uh, 
you have basically two positions when you could, for example, do something like collecting things, uh, trying to do some uh, more or less safety actions, and this way transformers are quite good. But uh, for example, during the action stage, in which you need uh, to mostly operate based on temporal components and temporal states in which you need to locate the enemy, uh, shoot it, uh, also try to move uh, uh, in, in parallel, uh, trying to not not to be hit by bullets and so on. Uh, LSTM-based approaches works much better and much faster. So of course, maybe training training our models will it's like much more much more number of iterations will result into comparable behavior. But still, we show that transformers are uh showing good performance on many scenarios uh, doesn't outperform uh, basic recurrent approaches and there is a room and study for further discussion of these results finally if we talk talking about qualitative results against like we show that transformer really significantly outperform many convolutional in many cases uh, it's like uh, convolutional encoders and uh, it's like maybe it's a good point to uh, consider some combinations of convolutions and transformers in general for encoder architecture and if we consider exact scenarios i would like also to discuss maybe some agent behaviors in detail so uh, because it's quite hard to demonstrate this during I mean, during some pre-recorded sessions, so I will just try to explain this uh, regarding different different scenarios. So, in health gathering, the agents basically show similar behaviors. Also, transformer model behaves less clumsily than others. Uh, convolutional model sometimes shows some kind of non-optimal behavior, missing nearest health kits, uh, even if they are directly on, on the straight line where we are going on. And LSTM-based model is less susceptible to this behavior, but still, I mean, Overall performance is quite quite close to each other. In defenders as a center and density corridor transformer based approach, uh, they have more economy and ammunition at management than other models. But basically, they shoot more efficiently, uh, having less mid number of mistakes, and while other behavior patterns are more or less the same. And in my way home, Fajin does not improve its performance uh, at all during the first 20 million uh, iterations, and even training for 10 million more, it does not, does not outperform. Uh, of the current approaches. And the situation is that only for this scenario, our convolutional model would perform both recurrent and transformer networks. Uh, maybe it's all it's also because uh, uh, learning to navigate uh, the exit in the in the maze, which has very similar visual features, uh, is better 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 encoded by convolutional architecture rather than recur recurrent or transformer based architectures. And again, in this much we have uh, the transformer based model shows like higher speed of training in the beginning, but then it pulls, uh, loses the uh, uh, LSTM based model with the light quickly leaps in terms of performance. So as for conclusions, like in terms of qualitative behavior, all agents do show policies that are close to optimal ones in the most complex decimal level. I mean, it's still uh, not much, is not much superior to the human level. Also, recurrent and transformer models try searching for weapons and power-ups and using them in combat, uh, but they usually do not do it in kind of believable manner. And uh, we would not say that they are quite smart to immediately identify uh, some useful objects uh, compared to how humans play. And of course, like our main, main results from this preliminary study, the transformers are worth studying for deeper, deeper rally to show that how different modifications may result in the good or bad performance. And uh, however, there is no unique solutions so outperform all the other approaches in all the settings in quite complex scenario. But it's like, especially uh, because we uh, train our agent in distributed manner on the straight resources. So in this case, maybe also interesting to see how different combination of A2C, A3C algorithms, so it's synchronous or asynchronous working, could be combined and improved to uh, further uh, produce novel results in this, in this field uh, if you have an access to uh, computational power for training agents for so long time. I would thank you again for your attention and I'm ready to answer your questions for the second talk. Okay, thanks, Ilya. Um, any questions from the audience? Okay, let me probably start. So, um, my first question is, um,
can uh, do you is it possible <laughs> is it still possible to compare your results with someone who you also used with doom just to yeah to to play with um, different uh, uh different possibilities with reinforcement learning so what is the frank comparison actually can you uh, give me uh, some thoughts yeah i mean yeah, I mean, I, I would rather say that we uh, we have started with not uh, just uh, taking some I mean, taking some numbers or quotes from the other papers, but we just fairly implemented uh, these four modifications and baselines. Uh, basically, uh, the first two modifications and baselines uh, they were already presented in the literature, in particular to different environments and with Zoom as well. So, for, for example, combination of one and two modifications they were presented for the Zoom environment, and what we show is that basically, I mean, not not all the reported values from other papers are really uh, really reproducible in our experiments, especially when we train the model in a distributed manner. Uh, so, uh, train agent in the distributed manner. So basically, I would rather say that uh, we lack, certainly lack compared to DeepMind results with uh, possibilities of combining something like graph neural networks and alpha nu alpha zero, something like this, because they're able to train very large models, uh, train, uh, use millions of dollars for training and so, so on. And in our approaches, we just could, uh, use very limited uh, resolution with a very limited encoders and test them out and just compare the results. And even then, comparing mean reward and max reward does not solve the problem because many agents, they have non-robust behavior. I mean, you could certainly uh, say that it's not human playing, but uh, in many cases and many tasks, uh, there is a hope that the rally will somehow be, use or, uh, be used for uh, making believable. Uh, bots, so basically uh, computer players or players under computer control. So in this case, we are nowhere close to good results, uh, despite uh, being able to train the agents that will kill uh, similar by efficiency compared to human players, but their behavior is not smart and not robust. Okay, thanks. And my other question, so you have several levels in uh, the wisdom um, simulation. Uh, uh, yeah, and um, uh, as far as I understand, you train different models for each level. So you show different charts uh, and yeah. uh, probably it's different models. So um, as far as I understand, um, you need to choose the most appropriate model uh during the real game or you know pretty well what is the level so how to uh so how to how to deal with the different levels uh in the same game yeah so there are various approaches such as curriculum learning or hierarchical reinforcement learning that for example try to combine or uh, learn uh, or train the agent on uh, levels with increasing quality or try to combine and switch between uh, between agents trained in different scenarios but uh, as far as I know, I mean, they, they result in very good performance in very restricted environments, but when comparing uh, this much scenario in which you need to combine all of them in one model, it's not good to just retrain them, I mean, from scratch or in consequent manner. So, uh, so, so not, not to retrain them from one from another in some consequent manner, but it's better to, to retrain it from scratch. And this kind of uh, simple scenario they are just used for verification that you are going to the right direction. So if your model could uh, get some useful results on that, then you proceed to this much. If no, then, I mean, there is no opportunity that you will, you will succeed in training in the uh, more complex environment. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from uh, anyone? <sighs> okay, thanks, Hilia, for yeah, this thank talk. You. And we can move uh, to the next speech. Uh, as far as I see, uh, I see even two authors uh, for the next um, paper regarding text capture traversal. Yeah, Valery Terikov and Denis Ishkov are with us. So who will be the presenter and you can share your screen. Uh, so, hello, should I start? Yeah, we can start. Actually, we have uh, a okay. schedule. Yeah. 
ぱいあるんですけど。Yeah, so nice. does full screen is visible? Yeah, yeah, everything. Nice, so you can start. Uh, okay, so uh, let's begin then. Um, my name is Denis Sashkov. I'm from Bauman Moscow State Technical University. And my today's speech is devoted to text cap capture traversal via knowledge installation of convolutional neural networks, exploring the impact of color channel selection. Uh, the aim of the work is to obtain a lightweight model. Uh, for optical character recognition of text capture, uh, which is capable of working on mobile devices. Uh, with the growing popularity of internet resources and social networks around the world, uh, the number of automatic uh, internet programs or bots is growing rapidly. Uh, such bots can perform diverse actions without human interaction. Uh, for example, uh, this can be Data, data collection or communication with real people. Uh, and uh, the problem is that these boats can uh, slow down the work of the site or even make it uh, bring it to failure. Uh, that's why people invented ways or instruments to detect uh, such boats and protect internet resources. And one of these instruments is capture. Uh, however, most of the existing works uh, in this field uh, investigate the recognition of capture with a fixed number of characters on the image, uh, which is currently quite rare and can be uh, seen in practice. Uh, there are many ways uh, for bypassing such protections and uh, one of the popular and uh, most popular one is uh, human powered recognition services. Um, however, such services uh, lack uh, in uh, speed and uh, they are also unstable uh, in terms of uh, accuracy uh, because of the human factor. And finally, if we talk about uh, deep learning solutions, uh, computer vision solutions, uh, they usually require a lot of computational power. And uh, that's the reason uh, why they are usually hosted on backend service and, uh, and, and so, uh, and similar <laughs> uh, high, high uh, power, high spec devices. Uh, and so uh, the research uh, carried out in our work allowed us to propose an effective method for training convolutional neural network on noisy, noisy labeled data for automatic capture recognition. And uh, also we studied the importance of uh, color channels uh, with the help of uh, learnable linear combination of color channels. Uh, so let's start with some uh, simple uh, theory uh, as you I already know uh, the word CAPTCHA stands for completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. Uh, and initially it is looking like a distorted text in the image. Uh, however, now uh, CAPTCHA has evolved into various forms. Um, and uh, uh, with the increase of uh, various protective instruments against bots, uh, bots uh, are also evolved and uh, uh, so there are also some sort of uh, competition between these two forces. Uh, um, and this results in uh, the creation of more complex capture designs. Uh, however, the old classical uh, text capture uh, form is still quite popular and used uh, in uh, many popular sites. In our experiments, we used the certain type of capture, the capture of the social network contacts. This uh, capture is presented in two formats, uh, namely normal and hard. Both formats have a resolution 130 pixels in width and 50 pixels in height. Uh, distorted elongated symbols, as you can see. Um, and uh, two or four uh, overlapping lines, uh, depending on uh, the format uh, of the capture. 
the background uh, of images is covered with ripples in cold tones. Um, and uh, the symbols used uh, for generations is uh, restricted to 21. Uh, and for the first uh, symbols, only six of them are used for generation. Uh, so for uh, collecting a data set, uh, uh, we were using two approaches. Uh, initially, without models, uh, we just download uh, uh, captures by the URLs uh, using a Python uh, script. And uh, in such a way, we have collected two and uh, one and a half million copies for normal and hard data, data sets, uh, respectively. Uh, they're unlabeled images uh, because they don't have labels. Uh, we divide it into, we, we select small subset of uh, uh, these uh, huge uh, uh, downloaded uh, images and uh, manually labeled it uh, to train uh, some initial models. Uh, also, we resize uh, images uh, to the uh, nearest powers of two. Uh, for training, we used a convolutional recurrent neural network. Um, and uh, actually, we train two uh, types of models, large and lightweight, because our goal, uh, final goal is to get a lightweight model, which can work on mobile devices or embedded devices. Uh, so for backbone uh, in large model, we use uh, architecture similar to Google Net. Uh, for uh, activation between layers, uh, we used uh, ReLU. Uh, as for recurrent block, uh, we used uh, bidirectional LSTM, LSTM layers. Um, and uh, after that, there follows uh, fully connected layers uh, uh, and uh, uh, softmax activational function. Uh, this uh, large architecture contains uh, five and a half million parameters for training. Uh, as for uh, lightweight model, uh, we use two architectures, uh, we tested on two architectures, mo mo mobile net and shuffle net. Uh, there is a typo <laughs> actually. Mm. And uh, we replaced uh, the recurrent block with uh, some uh, one dimensional convolutions uh, to speed up uh, some computations because uh, recurrent uh, layers are known uh, that they can be parallelized. Uh, and such uh, architecture uh, contains around 260,000 uh, parameters, 260,000 parameters, and uh, which is uh, uh, 21 times less comparing to a large one. Uh, further, we decided to improve for uh, uh, the recognition accuracy of a lightweight model with the help of a relatively novel technique known knowledge distillation. Uh, so for a large model, uh, a nickname teacher is introduced. Uh, in the case of offline distillation, which we used in our study, uh, its parameters are reached throughout the training. Uh, a lightweight model is uh, referred as a student uh, its weights are updated during distillation process. Uh, and in addition to the standard loss function, a second term uh, is introduced, which compares the smooth uh, predictions uh, of a teacher and student. Uh, this allows uh, the student to approximate the probability distribution of uh, the teacher's predictions. And as was shown in some previous studies by other authors, uh, this helps to achieve uh, better accuracy for the student. Uh, since uh, images contain text sequences of various lengths, uh, it is proposed to use uh, connectionist temporal classification function. Uh, the, the authors of the original paper uh, have shown that this function is uh, differentiable. 
And this fact, uh, fact allows us to use it as a last function, which is uh, very good <laughs> in our case. And we use uh, this uh, loss function as a standard function, uh, both for training a student and a teacher. Um, as, for, as for additional uh, term, uh, we use uh, kulbach labeler divergence between uh, smoothed predictions of uh, teacher and student. Uh, and the resulting loss uh, for uh, knowledge distillation of student uh, is a weighted sum between uh, these two losses. Um, for evaluating, if we speak about evaluating the quality, uh, we use two metrics. Uh, one of them is a normalized Lowenstein distance uh, between the decoded predictions and the true labels. And uh, another one is uh, the fraction of correct answers or accuracy, which can be also uh, expressed in terms of the Lewinstein distance. And accuracy we used for uh, uh, evaluating the models after training. Uh, also during the training process, images uh, with the capture are augmented in online, online fashion. Uh, we apply uh, various transformations, uh, distortions, cl color jittering, closely compressions, uh, blurring, noising. Um, for uh, this uh, task, uh, we use uh, a Python library named Augmentations. Uh, and you can see the full list of uh, used augmentations uh, in the slide. Uh, so this uh, slide represents uh, the proposed approach uh, of training uh, a lightweight model on noisy data. Training of the classifier model uh, is proposed uh, to be carried out in an iterative fashion. Uh, here, iteration includes automatic labeling uh, of an additional images, combining them with uh, the initial ones and training new model from scratch uh, on new larger data set. Uh, we should talk about uh, why this process is automated. Uh, actually, the lack of necessity of a person in this process of labeling can be explained uh, by the simple fact that there is a feedback from the site. Uh, so in the case when uh, the model recognizes the capture correctly, uh, the screen form of uh, the, the capture disappears. Otherwise, uh, the screen form remains and the image is replaced. And we can utilize this information uh, to understand the, when on the model correctly labels uh, uh, image and then it uh, uh, recognizes it incorrectly. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, the student is trained after achieving the desired quality of the teacher. Uh, teacher labels uh, millions of images that we collected initially uh, without uh, feedback from the site. And yes, so these uh, uh, labelings uh, contain mistakes and thus uh, the name for this uh, huge corpora of data uh, can be named noisy noisy labeled. And uh, on this noisy huge uh, data set, we train a lightweight model. Uh, we have a need in this extended and accurate data set because a small set may not be enough for su successful knowledge uh, distillation. Uh, as for the um, importance of uh, RGB channels on the accuracy of this student, uh, we train uh, student five times uh, on normal uh, format of capture with standard loss function on each of the color channels. After that, they evaluate the quality on the holdout set. Each run uh, we restrict uh, uh, by time. Uh, if we say sp uh, more specific, uh, we restrict it by three hours of uh, GPU budget. Uh, this method can answer us uh, how, uh, no, which, is, which uh, col uh, color channel is 
uh, impact the on the quality of the model the best but can't answer how uh, color channels interact with each other to do so we also train um, pair on pair of channels for example on red and blue uh, also in our study we compare obtained results with other color projection methods like training on per pixel uh, maximum value among channels uh, or on NTSC grayscale uh, images. Uh, also, uh, finally, that in order to uh, find the optimal linear combination, we implemented the custom neural network layer with three learnable parameters, as you can see from the slide. Uh, layer receives uh, RGB image as an input and outputs image with only one uh, color channel. This operation actually is equivalent uh, to applying one convolutional two-dimensional filter with a kernel size of one uh, without bias parameter. Uh, and these three parameters are initialized with uh, uh, NTSC coefficients and are updated via backpropagation. Uh, by taking the magnitude uh, of learned coefficients, uh, we can estimate uh, the importance of each color channel on a specific data set. Uh, here you can see which uh, uh, hardware we used for training. Uh, and here are the results we obtained. According to the results, it can be seen that the teacher model reaches a quality of about 99% on normal format and 98% uh, on hard format capture. Lightweight models are uh, trained according to the previously described method, uh, lose to the teacher by 10% and by 20% respectively. At the same time, training with uh, uh, this additional term in, in the loss function uh, helps uh, to increase the accuracy of the model uh, by a visible margin. Uh, the size of the training sample affects the final quality of the model which is quite intuitive. Uh, as for the results, uh, for this is the results for normal format. We also have the results for hard format capture. You can see that uh, hard uh, data set requires more training examples. The saturation zone occurs in a region of 100,000 images uh, versus uh, 20,000 uh, images uh, for a normal one. Also, from the obtained data, we can see that uh, the model starts learning in the region of around uh, several hundred images. So uh, that means uh, it is enough to manually label only a small subset of images and uh, uh, use uh, previously described iterative approach uh, to automatically label and, and uh, obtain a huge data set. Uh, as for estimation of the impact of separate color channels on models quality, we can conclude that training on red channel gives uh, uh, equal results uh, to, to training on full color channels. Uh, also training on grayscale images give um, similar uh, results as for training on full color channels uh, and training on mix. Uh, uh, with mixed layer, uh, we can see that uh, the results are statistically better. Here are uh, actually the learned coefficients for the mixed layer. And uh, we can see that uh, red channel is uh, really uh, indeed has the greatest impact on the given capture data set. Uh, also, um, we investigated the case then uh, malicious users can train a smaller model only on this one color channel and we um, decided um, to uh, think about some ways how to prevent it uh, how to prevent such scenarios uh, and we also train uh, the same model uh, the same time budget uh, on uh, uh, hue diversity images. So we randomly change the hue of the image. Uh, and uh, these results uh, um, in what you can see, uh, the 
magnitudes of channels importances uh, somehow uh, became more uniform. Uh, the resulting lightweight models uh, was converted to Onyx model format, which allows us to launch it in browser on the client side. Uh, in the browsers, models are executed in the JavaScript programming language. As proof of concept, uh, uh, you can uh, see the demonstration stand, which is uh, shown here, or you can access via this link or QR code. Uh, and to sum up, uh, a method of training a lightweight model uh, on inaccurate labels from another model was formed. Uh, the influence of the training sample size on the recognition accuracy is studied. Um, the need for color diversity in capture design was identified. Otherwise, there is a vulnerability in capture by where uh, malicious users can train uh, a model on one of the most informative color channel. Um, the proposed method uh, allows you to train convolutional neural network models and use them to bypass text capture on low powered embedded devices. And that's all uh, for my speech. Uh, thanks for your attention. I'll be glad to answer your questions. Yeah, thanks, Denis. Any questions from anyone? <clears throat> I have a small question. Uh -huh. Please. Um, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. But uh, as I understand, you more played on the dark side, I think. Uh, and uh, what do you think are other possibilities to improve to improve the defense on the automatic uh, capture recognition? So yeah, as we speak about uh, some defense approaches, uh, this uh, text capture no, thing uh, is quite old actually. And uh, if we speak uh, about of Kontakte, specifically, this capture was not changed for years, I think uh, for 10 years already. Uh, there are some uh, better approaches, uh, which is uh, uh, more user-friendly actually. And uh, I think that uh, the approach that uh, uses uh, Yandex uh, is uh, quite good and uh, it, uh, uh, no, the idea of the approach uh, is that uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, making more complex uh, capture, more adding more symbols, uh, they uh, uh, lock some uh, user activities before and uh, during uh, filling this capture field. Yeah, and uh, if uh, these statistics uh, are not uh, mm, are a normal or uh, they are no, uh, as, as you can understand uh, uh, by these uh, additional features you can build a binary classification uh, model which will tell you uh, when the user is a board and uh, then the user is uh, actually a human a real human and this information can be utilized uh, uh, to uh, defend and to uh, maybe blocked this uh, uh, bad uh, bots programs, uh, which fills uh, the caption under one seconds, and uh, and and by other features you can also detect uh, this uh, malicious uh, programs and bots. Do you answer your question? Uh, thank you. I, I have a small, a small other question. Um, have you experimented only with uh, the capture you talked about in your paper, or you also considered other, other captures from other sites, from other sources? I mean, texture captures. Yes. 
Yeah, understand your question. As I said uh, in the beginning, there are only 21 symbols and uh, they don't, uh, they have uh, maybe three or four digits and uh, not the full uh, English uh, alphabet. Uh, so this uh, model only knows these uh, 21 symbols. And if you test it on other captures, uh, it uh, cannot recognize some uh, symbols yes, that I they... See. I see, but maybe you had some preliminary experiments with other, with other sites, with other captures. Mm. Or you were... We actually tested the model strength on a normal capture to predict uh, hard capture, and uh, uh, the results was quite bad. I, I don't remember about 2% maybe uh, the recognition ability uh, was dropped significantly. Uh, but uh, on, on the other hand, if we evaluate uh, the model trained on hard, uh, uh, hard uh, data set, which uh, sees uh, from six to seven characters, um, and we try to predict uh, a normal uh, one, and then the drop in accuracy is not so uh, significant. I think it was around 20%. Uh, not uh, so it, it can be used for predicting uh, predicting more uh, more simpler simpler captures i think okay i see and um, have you experimented with uh, distortion models i mean maybe you have tried to generate uh, these captures yourself oh uh, yeah actually at the beginning, uh, uh, then the idea um, of recognizing capture, uh, then the <laughs> there then there was a, a goal to recognize capture. Mm, then it uh, appears. Uh, we uh, tried to use the synth synthetic data sets where we. Uh, generate uh, similar uh, captures, but uh, because of uh, uh, the not so uh, accurate generation, I think procedure, uh, the um, difference between with, uh, with, with domains, two domains, uh, the real domain and the synthetic domain uh, can't uh, allow us to get uh, uh, good results. And so we decided to go uh, by other path, by, by our day, by other way, uh, by labeling, yes. uh, manually uh, labeling uh, the original. Yes, I, I, I see. And the, your, your answer uh, lead me to the thought that uh, the site should just uh, replace the generating model from time to time to prevent uh, training and uh, bypassing the capture. Do you think so? Mm. Yeah, how, however, these uh, human powered services, which are uh, paid, so you pay for uh, recognition, they are robust for this uh, uh, types of uh, rotation of capture <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, this will not help for those who uh, will want uh, for no and uh, the cost of uh, the solution uh, or the way to uh, break this uh, uh, captures uh, so they will find a way to uh, bypass it if you even if you rotate it uh, every day uh, that's what I think. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for this uh, fruitful discussion. So, um, actually, I have very short question to you. So, as far as I see, um, your student models still work uh, worse when compared to the teacher model. So, the accuracy of the teacher model is <laughs> um, actually uh, like an ideal. Yeah. And uh, the teacher, uh, the student model uh, reaches some ninety percent, so they are ten percent uh, uh, worse um, in accuracy. So my question is, if this is true, 
then is it uh, still necessary to use lightweight models? Because you know that you can, so when you uh, recognize the capture incorrectly, then it typically has some delay in uh, viewing the next capture. So you waste time. So what do you think, do we need to an accurate model, which is slightly more difficult, or we need a lightweight student model, which is not so accurate and we can waste time just because of our errors, your errors. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, if we talk about this trade-off uh, in accuracy and recognition type and maybe uh, devices requirements, uh, uh, if we talk uh, specifically about uh, contact capture, then uh, they don't have such uh, delay. And as I stated earlier, as I stated earlier, uh, when you uh, fill this field incorrectly, a new capture appears immediately without uh, delays. Uh, so. Uh, that's actually also a bad thing about uh, <laughs> security uh, and protection uh, from bots uh, in of contact. Um, however, yeah, in on other resources, I think there are this uh, delay, and uh, uh, I think uh, it's uh, application specific. Uh, of, it depends uh, from what you are. I really want to do if uh, you are a user and uh, uh, this uh, capture thing uh, uh, annoy you, uh, then uh, maybe mm, such uh, uh, not uh, imper not such imperfect uh, quality can still be mm, pleasable and. Uh, uh, good for you, but uh, if you're a, <laughs> a bad person, a hacker who uh, have millions of accounts and uh, tries to uh, maybe cut, uh, may maybe somehow socially in uh, engineered, uh, may make some um, uh, influence on uh, uh, people's uh, uh, maybe. Um, ideas and so on, uh, then uh, you can uh, use and you uh, would want to use a, a near perfect model. Uh, so I think the answer is it depends. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. And I believe we can move to the next speaker. Yep. So Alexey Krozhalov and uh, some threshold and techniques for brand vessels. So Alexey, you're uh, Welcome to share your screen. Yeah, okay, it's perfect. You can start your presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kuzhal Alexey. I'm from Moscow Polytechnic University, and I would like uh, to present you our research analysis of thresholding methods for the segmentation of brain vessels. This uh, work uh, was done in collaboration with Andrei Filipovich my scientific supervisor. Uh, one of the contemporary tasks of computer vision today is development of algorithms for cerebral aneurysm recognition. This task is mainly solved by means of uh, artificial neural networks. And the artificial neural networks training result uh, essentially depends on the data preprocessing. And an important stage of the data preprocessing for fulfillment of the above task is segmentation of cerebral vessels, as uh, the structure of vascular tree is an informative characteristic of an image for aneurysm recognition. Uh, vascular tree segmentation can be performed by threshold segmentation methods with use of a contrast agent, which is perfused into the vessels during angiography. The advantage of the threshold segmentation methods is possibility to get acceptable results with minimum requirements to computational resources. So uh, the aim of this work is to investigate 
the effectiveness of threshold segmentation methods concerning the problem of segmenting cerebral vessels based on uh, rotational and geography results to select the most appropriate method for data preprocessing for use in developing an automated system for detecting cerebral aneurysms. Uh, in this study, we use the data published within the framework of the Cerebral Aneurysm Detection Challenge, CADA. The data were obtained with Axiom, Artis, and Geographic System of the C-ARM type. The data set includes 110 images, and for each image, there is a segmentation mask of uh, regions of interest. Uh, image size and voxel size are presented on this slide. In this study, we considered the following thresholding methods. OTSUS method, Jens thresholding method, triangle method, and Savula method. The first three are global methods, and the last one is local. Uh, we have segmentation masks for cerebral vascular aneurysms. So one of the criteria for evaluating the quality of solving the problem under consideration was the value of the intersection of the selected region with the region of interest. It is the first equation on the slide. In addition to maximizing the intersection, we are interested in ensuring that the selected area covers the minimum number of voxels unrelated to vessels. So we have no way to directly calculate the number of false positives since we do not have a segmentation mask for the vascular network. However, we can estimate the volume of the selected area without the area of the interest. Uh, it is the second equation presented on this slide. Uh, since the area corresponding to the vascular network must be connected, it is proposed to use the selection of the largest connected area after binarization in order to assess the statistical significance of the allocation of the largest connected area. The Wilcoxon test was used and the null hypothesis of the test is that the distribution of uh, differences between samples D is symmetric with respect to zero. And uh, to compare the results obtained with various thresholding methods, it is proposed to use the Friedman test. This slide shows the results of applying various binarization methods to the analyzed data. The column Wilcoxon test contains the values of test statistic W and their corresponding p-values calculated for each method according to the intersection metric. The samples to be compared are the samples obtained with use of the selection of the largest connected area and without it. As you can see, we have uh, insufficient ground, uh, grounds for rejecting the null hypothesis at the level of significance of uh, 0 0.05 only for the OTSUS method and the triangle method. For the second metric, we obtain statistically significant results for all methods. For a subsequent comparison, we used the values of the target metrics obtained using the selection of the largest connected region. And for a visual interpretation of the results obtained, we built a box plot for the intersection metric distributions. And the diagram shows that the largest median value and uh, the smallest spread of values relative to it are obtained for the triangle method. And the largest number of outliers is obtained for a Savula method, and uh, that's why it was excluded from the subsequent consideration. And uh, the Friedman test was used to compare these methods, and uh, at the level of significance 0 0.05, there are sufficient grounds for rejecting the null hypothesis. And in order to find out 
which methods produce statistically significant differences between, between uh, the results, uh, pairwise comparisons were performed. And based on the results obtained, we can say that statistically significant differences are present between all pairs of the considered methods. And since the triangle method showed the best results, we can conclude that the use of this method for the solution of the problem is most preferable. And to confirm the results obtained, we carried out an analysis of the operation of the considered algorithm on a test image. We took as a test image a slice of the original image, which included a region of interest. Uh, this slide shows examples of the operation of the analyzed algorithms on a test image. The first line shows results before the selection of the largest connected area. And the second line shows the results after that. Uh, from the examples given, it can be seen that the Otsus and Jens method identified only large vessels with high contrast. And triangle method turned out to be more sensitive to the selection of the less contrasting small vessels. But um, when using it, some noise components are also highlighted, which are removed after the selection of the largest connected area. To evaluate the structure of the selected region in the volume, uh, 3D reconstructions of the regions obtained based on various algorithms were constructed using the 3D slicer program. And in general, we can say that they confirm the previously made observations that the Otsus and Jens methods mainly delineate large vessels with high contrast, and the triangle method makes it possible to select a wider vascular network, uh, including low contrast vessels of small size. Based on the results of the analysis, it was concluded that among the considered methods, the most suitable is triangle method, with the subsequent allocation of the largest connected area. This method turned out uh, to be more sensitive to the isolation of low contrast vessels of small size, and therefore it allows for obtaining a more complete picture of the vascular network structure. And also we can say that vessel segmentation can be used as a data preprocessing method in the classical convolutional neural networks and also for development of more complicated graph models. And um, I can say that I'm currently working on uh, development of an algorithm for cerebral aneurysm recognition. And the preliminary results of my recent experiments show that the proposed data preprocessing method allows to make an artificial neural network training process more stable and to get higher results from the perspective of recognition accuracy if compared with uh, the used classical methods of preprocessing such as normalization or standardization. Uh, thank you for your attention. I will be glad to answer your questions. Okay, thanks. So any questions from anyone? Uh, probably I have some questions to you. So, uh, first of all, uh, could you clarify uh, the choice of the thresholding techniques in your work? So, I mean, there are plenty of image binarization methods, including something with deep learning, I don't know, some deep neural networks and so on. So, what? Uh, how, how did you choose? Uh, these techniques that we compared them. So what's uh, the, some ideas from this part? Um, most of the papers uh, dedicated to uh, solving this task uh, is used to neural networks as the main algorithm. Uh, 
uh, but uh, um, there, uh, there is a lack of um, data sets for vessel segmentation that are uh, available in public domain and uh, in most of the works authors use their own data and uh, um, in my work task of vessels segmentation considered as one of the stages of data preprocessing or aneurysm recognition so it's not uh, the main task for me so i uh, consider um, this methods uh, as uh, a preprocessing method uh, that must be um, and fully automated uh, they must uh, not require interaction from user and as i said before i have no label data to train a neural network so uh, the main idea why i I decided to choose thresholding methods uh, was uh, to investigate uh, which results I can get with it. Maybe it would be sufficient for my purpose. And in this case, there will no be necessary to use um, more complex method that requires more uh, computational resources, for example. Okay, thanks, I see. So you say that you have only preliminary results, I mean, in the downstream task of classification of uh, this uh, vessels. Uh, so, but um, anyway, so you say that there are some, um, uh, there are some uh, increase in accuracy by using your, um, by using this um, uh, threshold and with uh, triangle technique, for example. So, but um, you say that, okay, it's better than use other pre-training, but um, do you have some feeling about comparison with existing other methods that probably are more smart than training the neural network, I don't know, ensemble. So I don't, some, some, some existing methods from existing papers. Uh, do you mean methods uh, for pre-training? I mean, uh, I mean for the whole task. I mean for the whole task because you say that you are interested in classifying of it. So again, I see that it's. Uh, you say that you have on the preliminary results, but nevertheless, <laughs> can you share? So you, even your preliminary results are comparable with um, existing results for this downstream task. Uh, I mean, for the classification of these vessels for for this data set, for this particular data set which you used. Mm -hmm. or you are uh, far from them that's is my question uh, thank you uh, i can say that i have tried uh, to use one of the preprocessing method that was proposed in one of the um, papers that uses the same data and um, there um, was proposed just to um, select um, uh, threshold value manually and uh, uh, just um, limit the intensity value of the image to this value. Uh, so when I tried to do so, uh, I found that um, uh, learning process was unstable for um, I'm tried to learn my network on random patches from original image because uh, it, it's uh, pretty huge and I use 3D convolutions and so I have uh, memory limitations. And when I tried to extract these patches where a region of interest is placed on the center, uh, uh, the learning process was okay. And when I tried to uh, use different sampling strategy, for example, uh, to extract patches 
with no guarantee that the region of interest will be on the center, it may be on the corner or something, or take different location. And um, then I uh, got problems with uh, uh, vanishing gradients. Uh, my learning process just stopped. And after I apply uh, thresholding, uh, it, um, uh, there was no such problem. And additionally, I added augmentations and uh, it was okay. Maybe it can be, um, it can be, uh, uh, it can relate to uh, um, optimization algorithm uh, parameters, for example, because I uh, perform this comparison using the same um, hyperparameters to eliminate the, um, uh, the effect of this factor. So maybe uh, then I can say uh, that thresholding is less sensitive to uh, using more large learning rate values, for example, and something like this. As I said, it's just preliminary results and I uh, uh, haven't performed uh, systematic uh, comparison yet. So, okay, thanks. Other questions? Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Alexei, for your presentation, for your answers. And I believe we can um, close our computer vision track of the ICE conference. So I cordially thank everyone, uh, our authors, uh, the listeners of our track who were with us uh, today. So thanks, everyone. And uh, let's... Uh, Let's move to let's move back to uh, the main track and uh, let's uh, visit ice tomorrow. So thanks and bye.